Welcome and hello everyone. I'm Aiden McGuire, Coalition Program Manager at Plastic Pollution Coalition. I'm really excited for today's discussion, so thank you for joining our July webinar, Designing a Plastic-Free Future with Regenerative Materials. Plastic Pollution Coalition is a nonprofit communications and advocacy organization that collaborates with an expansive global alliance of organizations, businesses, and individuals to create a more just, equitable, and regenerative world free of plastic pollution and its toxic impacts. All right, we have three poll questions today to get a sense of who is joining us. Each question will appear for about 20 seconds. It's quick, so please answer quickly. All right, poll number one. Which of the following are examples of regenerative materials? Hint, select all that apply. It's fun to watch these poll questions come in, these responses. Seems like algae and seaweed are top favorites along with mushroom mycelium. In the 90 percentile of folks that responded, seems PHA is uh, a little bit more controversial but untreated natural fibers, wool, chitin, and flax are crowd favorites as well. All right, poll number two. What qualities of a regenerative material are most important to you? We have two favorites uh, that are most important to folks when thinking about what a regenerative material is and means to them. Um, the top two are that it degrades safely in natural environments and restores nutrients, the second is that um, it's important uh, for people to be non-toxic to people and the environment. And the third being that production does not drive environmental injustices and pollution. All really important. All right, let's move on to our last poll question. Thanks for participating in the first two. The last one we have is that bridge. Which plastic products have you seen replaced by regenerative materials? Right, not to sway any answers. I see a lot of rigid cutlery and straws coming in. Definitely packaging. Interesting to see vegan leather and other apparel. It's a high percentage of folks. Thin films, less so. Plastic coatings and sprays, um, less so as well. And single-use sachets. So seems the thin, thin packaging. Um, uh, people have not seen regenerative materials replace yet. Um, while rigid cutlery straws, um, those things, utensils seem to be the most common that people recognize, um, insulated and protective packaging. That's good. We have one of those folks in the room today, um, vegan leather and other apparel. That's, that's a little bit higher than I would have expected, but, um, interesting to see. All right. Thank you for participating in our poll questions today. We're going to hear from Hoa Duan, head of impact and sustainability from Notpla, Renatia Massian, Senior Sustainability Manager at Cruise Foam, and Bailey Mishler, Co-Founder and Design Director at Prowl Studio. All right, I'd like to set the stage here a little bit before we introduce our panelists. Plastic is found everywhere on earth, including in our own bodies. We've made so much of the material that the mass of plastics we produce outweighs all terrestrial and marine animals combined, if you can imagine that. A business as usual scenario that you see on the screen will continue to suffocate our planet, exacerbate a human health crisis, and make the fight against climate change that much more difficult. No longer can we operate with a blind eye. From a business perspective, doing so poses a number of legitimate risks from changing consumer demand to mounting legislation and litigation costs. It's clear that the plastic era must come to an end. We need new materials and we need systems change. So today we're gonna to learn about two ocean-based feedstocks, what makes a material regenerative, and how some of these materials are being employed by designers to create functional applications that replenish natural ecosystems. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our first panelist, Renata Massian. Renata is an environmental enthusiast and the Senior Sustainability Manager at Cruise Foam, where she supports the development of cutting edge packaging that embodies a new frontier in sustainable materials. Renata spearheads cruise, cruise foams initiatives in responsible sourcing, life cycle assessment, and environmentally conscious disposal strategies. She combines her deep understanding of global dynamics with technical expertise to drive positive environmental change 
and empower a universal drive for sustainable progress. Welcome, Renata. Thanks for being here. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for that, Aiden. So as Aiden said, I work for Cruise Foam. I'm just going to talk a little bit very quickly about what is Cruise Foam, why is Cruise Foam, what we do, and a little bit about the environmental work that I do at Cruise Foam. So how did Cruise Foam originate? It was started by John Feltz and Marco Rolandi when they were at the UCSC Rolandi lab. And they were working with a really novel material called chitin, which is the second most abundant biopolymer on earth. It is found in mushrooms, it's found in shrimp shells, it's found in everything that needs a really high strength to weight ratio, which is what makes chitin so exciting. So they were working with chitin and they were also surfers and they were going out and realizing that they were surfing on these big boards of foam that would eventually up end up in the landfill or even in the ocean. And they were looking at the waves and the waves were filled with trash as well. And they thought, what if we could use chitin and its strength to weight ratio to make a really amazing surfboard foam? So they started with these surfboard blanks and then realized that they could not only change the surfing industry, they could change the plastic packaging industry as well. So where is Cruise Foam now? Now we have expanded our vision to replace all single-use plastic foam. And we have created a ASTM D6400 tested compostable foam. And through a lot of R&D, we still use chitin. It is a much smaller portion of our formula now. But what we've done is we've been able to change our formula so that it is now 70% upcycled food waste, which is one of my favorite things about cruise foam. It means that we can take food waste that is headed towards the landfill. We can divert it from the landfill, give it a second useful life with our foam. And then once our foam is at the end of its useful life, it can then be composted and turned back into usable soil, which can be put back into the food industry. So that makes it a really circular product and that's something we're really excited about. Quickly, our commercial operations, how is cruise foam made? It's actually not that exciting. It is the raw materials are purified, mixed and pelletized. You can see that in the picture on the bottom left there. Those pellets are then heated and extruded. So that extrusion equipment is the same equipment that is used for EPS and EPE and other packaging foams. So there's no capital equipment required for the transition to cruise foam. And then it basically spits out cruise foam, which can be sold in planks and sheet profiles. And then it can also be die cut into whatever you need it to be holding and protecting. Cruise foam can do that. Just a quick product sampling. On the left here, we have our Cruise Cool. That is our main product as of now. So anything that you need to be shipped from A to B and keep it cold, the Cruise Cool can do that. So we work with a lot of meal kits. We work with fish. We work with even coffee that needs to be kept cold. That can all be put into the Cruise Cool. Cruise Kush is a much larger array of things. So anything from a small microwave to a large refrigerator or a TV, that is a block and brace formula. So that can be put on the corners of whatever needs to be shipped. And the Cruise Kush can then keep that intact and safe throughout its shipping. And then on the right here, we have our Eco Vino, which we have created in conjunction with Bay Cities packaging. So wine is obviously, wine and wine bottles are very, very fragile and they're really hard to ship especially in the summer months so we have made a cruise foam combined with corrugate packaging system that keeps those wine bottles intact and cool enough to be able to ship even in the summer months so that is the main product sampling of cruise foam and i will hand it back over to aiden thanks renata i love cruise products i've seen them myself and um yeah, they're truly incredible. All right. I'd now like to introduce Hoa Doan. Hoa is a climate policy expert with experience in consulting, public sectors, and entrepreneurship. She was a net zero policy advisor in the UK Prime Minister's office at 10 Downing Street, overseeing the delivery of decarbonization programs across the building and transport sectors. She is currently the head of impact and sustainability at NACPLA, 
a UK startup that recently won the Earthshot Prize for its plastic-free consumer packaging products made from seaweed and plants. Welcome, Hoa. Thank you, Adrian, for having Nokla. And hello, everyone. A uh, very warm welcome. We are Nokla is a sustainable packaging startup. We are based in London. Nokla was born out of desire to tackle the plastic pollution crisis. And the name Nokplus is actually short for Not Plastic. And our mission is to create packaging that comes from nature and disappears back into nature quickly and harmlessly. So for almost 100 years, disposable packaging has been characterized by a material that do not match the intended purpose. Consider the packaging journey that, uh, of an item that you use every day. The moment that you enjoy that bar of chocolate might take 10, 12 minutes, but the packaging that is arriving will last around over uh, hundreds of years. So this is why we set our Nopla to solve this problem. So we look at examples in nature and ask the question, what if packaging could disappear as quickly as a fruit peel? So we use Mother Nature as inspiration. We have developed a new generation of packaging material that is so natural, you can even eat it. So currently, Nopla is the only new material that has been recognized in the EU as not plastic. This is because we meet two specific criteria that our input material, seaweed, is found in nature and our process hasn't altered the polymers in any way. This means that we have a material that can truly be naturally biodegradable because it has existed in nature for thousands of years. Seaweed is our superhero. It is an abundant, fast-growing resource that doesn't require fresh water, land or fertilizer to thrive. Seaweed is not only sustainable, but it is also highly effective at absorbing carbon dioxide, making it a powerful ally in the fight against climate change as well. With over 12,000 species and a growth rate of up to a meter per day, even if we were to replace all single-use plastic with seaweed-based materials, we would require less than 0.06% of ocean space to grow the necessary amount of seaweed to do this. So, over the last few years, Nopla has been studying the superpower of seaweed to replace plastic from a wide range of packaging applications. From OHO, our edible liquid bubble that has helped to remove thousands of plastic bottles in marathons and other large sporting events, Nopla coating, a seaweed base lining for takeaway food containers that we're currently selling in the millions of. Nopla film, a flexible material that can replace plastic film that's normally used in packaging, dry foods, cosmetic and home care products. We also have just launched our seaweed base ice cream spoons as well this summer. And that's not it. Our product not only helps to tackle plastic pollutions, but they also have a significantly lower carbon footprint than conventional plastic. So our products also help fight climate change as well. So far, we have replaced over 10 million single-use plastic items with Nopla products. But with over 300 million tons of plastic produced every year, we know that there is still some way to go. And to do this, we will need your help. So please join us in the seaweed revolution. Thank you. For power of seaweed. Who doesn't love that? Always really great to see the amount of the applications coming out from NOPLA. Thank you, Hoa, so much. Um, agreed, we have a lot of work to do. All right, and now I'd like to introduce our final panelist, Bailey Mishler. Bailey is the co-founder and design director of Prowl Studio, an industrial design and research studio, creating new solutions for people on the planet by employing materials, processes, and technology more responsibly. Her design roles at industry-leading companies such as Steelcase and Coalesce have instilled in her strong skills and detailed attention towards industrial design, 
furniture production, color material finish development and specification, brand communications and interior design. Thanks for being with us today, Bailey. Happy to have you. Thank you so much for having me and just have to say how much of an honor it is to be sharing the panelist stage with these material superstars. Our studio has been such fans of Notfla and Cruise Foam. So thanks for having me. Um, as Aiden mentioned, um, I am co-founder and design director of Prowl. We are women owned and based in the dog patch neighborhood of San Francisco. My co-founder and I founded Prowl really out of a surmounting frustration of um, having been in the design field for over a decade and witnessing over and over again the damaging results of our industry, feeling that we really had to do better by aligning our values with our skill sets. Our studio mantra is we begin with the end. It's really not common for design studios to think this way, to think about the inevitable end of life of something you spend so much time on and you believe will live on timelessly in the world. Um, but it is a crucial needed mind shift in order to really um, produce regenerative goods for the world. And to operate our practice in this way, we set out uh, to develop these five principles that help hold us accountable for our own work and to kind of continue to drive marching orders for how we operate and how we tackle each and every both internally led and client led uh, design problem we face. The one I really wanted to focus on today, even though we holistically think about all five and every uh, project we work on, um, materials are sort of the core of it all. Um, and we place materials at the center of development for us. Um, as I mentioned with it being so rare for designers to think about the end, it is a must. And because at the end of the day, everything we make is simply distilled down to its material composition. So I thought I'd maybe just walk through three high level projects to kind of show how our studio operates, the way we think about materials and the questions that we're asking ourselves. One such project was in collaboration with a uh, San Francisco Bay Area uh, micro factory and furniture producer called Model Number. Um, their shop contains both subtractive and additive manufacturing methods of wood milling and large scale 3D printing. And in working with them, we asked ourselves, what if we could make a truly wasteless loop? If we were to think about on the manufacturing floor, taking what is otherwise thrown out of sawdust or wood scraps from the milling process and the subtractive process and make it a useful add to the additive process, the 3D printing. And through that collaboration, we produced the um, gather, which utilizes the sawdust from the milled table to then create the stools around and have this complete endless loop system within a collection. So thinking a little bit about um, smaller loop circularity, reducing waste um, in this example of work. Another way in the spirit of reducing waste is we asked ourselves, how could we challenge the upholstery methods of today with furniture which are conventionally cut and sew. A pattern is laid out, you cut out what you need, and unfortunately the rest is usually discarded, adding to kind of the textile waste crisis that we're in as well. So through this, we worked with um, an Amsterdam-based 3D knit company called Vibore to create right fit, exactly as you need it sized upholstery that also was helping tell a narrative um, about wildfires, which plague California and many other parts of the world now on an annual basis due to climate change. Um, through the 
technology of 3D knitting, we were able to translate um, the charred destructive side of the wildfire seen in the black textile pattern, but also remind um, the consumer or those attending this exhibition in particular that there can still be hope and that there can still be genera regeneration even in the aftermath as seen in the green textile. And then last but not least, um, we developed the peeled chair and the journey to that was asking ourselves, what if something only lasted as long as it needed to? Um, perhaps uh, slightly overly provocative to ask such a question of furniture, um, but we set out to create a compostable chair with every component, every material used deriving from hemp, which is a superpower crop that we had the, we basically used this project to uh, as an excuse to research and finally utilize hemp, which we had been a fan of for some time. Um, through this chair, we not only thought about the regeneration, the healthier inputs and the end of life, but also we're able to think about the practicality and functionality of um, a stackable, flat packable and component change piece of furniture, um, but all coming from a healthier source. Um, so it's just a little bit of a tip of the iceberg about some of our work and the ways that our methods start to apply materials and ways of thinking about begin with the end and end of life. Um, we're really excited to be here. So I'll hand the microphone back to Aiden. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bailey. Really appreciate all of that and fascinating to see all of the work that you do and how you bring these projects to life. All right, that's it for our panelists' presentations. So now we're gonna move on to the discussion part of our panel. I'm gonna start by asking panelists some questions submitted by attendees ahead of time and sprinkle in a few live questions as we go and see where it takes us. Um, so feel free to ask more questions in the Q&A feature and we will do our best to answer them live. All right, first question I have um, is, how can we as sustainability communicators, and and I'll throw in um, and, and just a general audience for folks that may not know about this, uh, about regenerative materials or their applications as much, identify and distinguish real sustainable regenerative materials from, from greenwashing, from the ones that you would maybe consider not. Um, Renata, maybe we can start with you and if anyone else wants to, to comment there. And there were some live questions about where were materials sourced, um, what's energy consumption, can they be composted? So um, maybe that helps to add context. Yeah, I think I have about a hundred things to say about <laughs> this. So I'll try to distill it down a little bit. First of all, to whoever submitted that question, thank you for being a sustainability communicator. I cannot do all of the science that I do without someone to help me communicate it effectively. So just a quick thank you. And then I think I will start by saying it's really hard to distinguish between greenwashing and not greenwashing. I think the main thing that I always look for is, is there any data to back up what a company or a person is saying. So we can say environmentally friendly, we can say eco, we can say sustainable, we can say a million different things, and that can mean nothing or it can mean everything. So Hoa actually said something really great earlier. She talked about how NOPLA can be up to 70% less CO2 impact than alternatives. And then there was a bunch of small print that actually said, hey, we've done the research and we have the data to back this up, as opposed to saying, this is really sustainable because we believe it is and we want it to be. So that's an awesome example of saying something really exciting and then funneling down and backing up with some actual data. So I think going also going back to the energy consumption portion, I will say life cycle assessment is a really wonderful tool to then be able to back up most sustainability claims. So for us, we do LCAs 
pretty regularly on our formulas. And that as an internal tool, it can tell us where the hotspots in the cruise foam product system. So not surprisingly, most of our impact comes from upstream emissions, meaning before our ingredients get to us, it, that's where our impacts come from because there is so much that happens before cruise foam is actually made. Our energy consumption is a very, very small, like 5% portion of our already smaller impact. So because we use already existing manufacturing and we really, really keep our energy hopefully down and our water consumption really low, we can then focus on where do we get our materials? How do we work with our suppliers to make sure that we are doing insetting, which basically means that we work with our suppliers to lower their CO2 emissions and other impact categories so that we then, as Cruise Foam, our entire product system has a more mitigated impact as well. So a little bit off topic of what's greenwashing, what's not, but using LCA, using other certifications and things that are really validated in the space can be a great way to distinguish who just slapped a leaf and some green coloring on their marketing and who's actually doing the work to make sure that they have a better material than whatever alternative they're trying to replace. Or Bailey, would you like to add on to that? I think I might bring in an example of how some government, especially in the EU and the UK, are currently trying to tackle some of that greenwashing. So there's has, they've recently introduced uh, what we call a green claims code, which is um, enforcing exactly what Renata has just said of actually any marketing claim that you have on your products or your website, it needs to be able to be backed by evidence and scientific evidence. So LCAs or any kind of independent tests or analysis or certification that you've done um, will you need to be able to present that if your claim was to be challenged so I think that is also one of the way that um, we kind of try to helping to separate some of these unsubstantive claim to company that are actually doing the work yeah yeah for us a prowl I mean, as Renata was saying, it is definitely hard at the surface to know right away because we're being marketed so many things at any given moment. I do think it is that double click or that drill down a little bit deeper to do a little homework on each material or each company or each brand. Um, and we're seeing, you know, very similar policy changes happening in the United States as well, where even being able to claim compostability within the state of California is changing a ton. Um, if if we're going to put things back to the earth and then those aren't healthy, it, you know, we all know the loop that that kind of it'll all trickle back on itself and on us. So um, cracking down on the right things, but it does require a little bit more attention from consumer level and from a specifier level um, on that data. All right, let's talk about existing markets and trends. Um, I'm curious to hear more about, in your view, which product applications are currently being prioritized, um, at least, you know, are, are most available in alternative formats and which, which materials are most promising. Um, you know, maybe in addition to a, a, a cruise cool or a, a not plus spray, you know, which ones are, are you seeing in, you know, growth in particular markets um, being prioritized? Um, a, a, a panelist uh, before, or sorry, a, um, um, a person asked in advance of this webinar that they have clients that are interested in sustainable options for packaging. Um, so in addition to this question is what's a good starting point um, for an organization uh, um, to begin their sustainable packaging journey. And uh, maybe Hoa, if you want to take this one first. 
Yeah, so I think um, more specifically with some of the materials that we work with, we're tackling um, the food contact materials or also um, other consumer products in home care as well. And we want to target these items because they are most or the majority of them are single use. They are very difficult to recycle. Almost none would get to, would be recyclable because they normally would be contaminated. And also um, the fact that um, in some certain contexts, um, there will still need to be single use options as opposed to refill, refill or reuse. Um, so that's why we're kind of currently targeting these markets. And also because of quick consumptions, um, these more nature-based materials are really suitable for those kind of markets as well. Um, and in terms of uh, for someone who's interested in looking at sustainable packaging options, um, I would say there, there are quite a few companies out there that can help to advise uh, like a design consultancy that can focus specifically on different type of materials. And we at Nopla as well, we also work with a lot of brands and we set up and what we call an um, innovation hub which is really a dedicated stream to help brands kind of guide them through what are their packaging challenge and how can our material help. So each of these companies would, would be able to, to help you um, advising either use their material, but also guide you into using others as well. There's a lot of clients we work with um, that uh, unfortunately our material might not be a good fit, but uh, we were able to kind of help them communicate, but also educate and raising awareness about some of the materials that they're currently using or some of the alternatives they're seeing in the market. Would anyone like to add on to that question? All right. How do we shift products and industries that rely heavily on plastic? I think that's th that's the key, right, is being able to scale these materials like what would buying milk look like going back to the milkman or what would the interior of a car look like? Um, and, and what, what are some of those hurdles that prevents us from adopting the use of these materials on, on a, um, uh, on a wide scale? Mm -hmm. Bailey, you want to start with this one? Yeah, I'll jump in on this one. Um, we've already touched on policy a little bit, but I do think that there's a lot of, policy needed to shift these things. Um, so I'd say like first and foremost, like in the question of how do we shift, I think there's some pressure needed to be applied there. Um, I think that a bigger um, financial advocacy, it's funny, I'm here as the designer, but I'm speaking about a lot of things that I, you know, we are champions of and we are involved in, but not necessarily expertise. We collaborate with a lot of people in policy and a lot of people in um, thinking about financial modeling. But when I think about financial advocacy, what I mean there is such the struggle with fighting plastic is that it is really affordable and obtainable. And often what's missed in evaluating the bottom line is the long-term thinking that adopting a closer, either a waste stream or a um, closer to your manufacturing stream, long-term has much better financial gains. Um, and I feel like that's not often thought about or communicated well in the, in the process of trying to get adopted, especially when new materials often do come with a slightly higher price point at the start. Um, it's funny, when you mentioned the milk man, we have seen so much uh, of an uptake in less of a transactional product um, model, and we're seeing so many companies shift to a service as an inclusion in the consumer journey. So if, you know, you may be buying a thing, but what comes with that thing is actually um, uh, an ecosystem of service, whether it's, you know, a return. I mean, the milkman model is kind of, we're seeing that with things like diapers or um, even like takeout food services. So I think there's kind of a people component uh, in all this that 
is coming into play. Uh, and then the last thing, I know I'm kind of going on, but the last thing that, that comes to mind, um, it kind of speaks to the first question about how do we how do we know when something's greenwashing or not? Is I sort of see the future of labeling and on the consumer side of helping consumers make better choices and a lot more clarity and focus. And um, you know, you could buy a chapstick that's made from something that's come the packaging is something compostable, but if it looks exactly like another plastic chapstick, it's hard to tell. Right. Um, so I think there's kind of a labeling revolution that I think is going to happen in helping shift a lot of the goods that we consume and purchase today. It's a really interesting point you're making. Um, one of the questions I did have was about the true cost of, of plastic, which um, I don't think we, we take into account. Businesses don't take into account. Governments don't take into account. Um, it, is, is that one of the major hurdles um, for for adopting these products on a larger scale? I'm wondering if um, Hoa or Renato, you want to speak to either either of those points a little bit more. Yeah, I can speak a little bit. Something I was thinking about when Bailey was speaking is, yeah, that true cost of plastic. I think and being honest and realistic about human consumption and human nature, most of the changes we've made have not been when we see it affecting the environment, it's when we see it affecting human health. So when we really think about the true cost of plastic, of it ended up ending up in our lungs and placentas and our bloodstreams and affecting the workers who work with the raw components of plastic, that is when we're gonna see that change. If we think about the best example of an international environmental treaty that has been successful is the, not the Kyoto Protocol, the Montreal Protocol, that was banning refrigerants and the reason why that worked was because it was affecting human health really really rapidly and there was a really good alternative so something that all of us on this panel are working on is creating those alternatives so that true cost of plastic we can see it happening i think almost every day i see a new article them finding microplastics in something else where they shouldn't be and then having readily available alternatives, it's what's going to really make that change in industries that rely on plastics really heavily. Yeah, and I would also kind of quickly jump in on the role of government on this. We have seen quite strong uh, regulations from Europe around banning single-use plastic, uh, chemicals of concern, um, especially ones in food contacts. And um, that's then really really surface uh, the facts that well there are some good alternatives but some of the more conventional material that we are currently using are actually affecting our health um, and in terms of tax and fees as well we also see some country that are now imposing plastic packaging tax and also um, the taxing not only manufacturer but also on the consumer end as well mainly to really raise awareness the tax is very little it's only a few cent but it will be added to your bill at the end and you will see that actually the it is not the true cost of a plastic or the material but it does raise a point as you look at your receipt and you realize um, the single-use packaging that you're using is made from plastic, and that's why that is um, that is there. So I think there are some quite powerful uh, legislations that government can start looking to impose. And as we start having alternative solutions as well, I think that's is uh, a lot of um, governments are really waiting for um, for businesses to be able to adopt new solutions so so that they could um, start rolling out some of these more progressive policy. And maybe transferring some government subsidies that heavily favor fossil fuels might help a little bit as well. Um, we have a few questions um, from the Q&A uh, about sourcing. I'd love to ask um, Specifically, where where are cruise foams feedstocks sourced from? Uh, Hoa, where where not you touched on this a little bit, but um, where where is your seaweed sourced from? Bailey, if if you have any um, comments about um, maybe some suppliers you work with, maybe fiber based suppliers, um, 
and are these feedstocks are they viable you know are 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 these are these feedstocks viable to replace plastic at the scale that we need and anyone can um can can start and jump in feel free yeah i can start here i'm so glad someone asked about this i love talking about sourcing uh, so it's as i mentioned before our LCA showed us not that we were surprised scope three emissions are always the largest. So our LCA showed us that most of our emissions are coming from our upstream emissions. So when we look at our sourcing, we have a really strong sourcing policy and we work with all of our suppliers every year to make sure that they are compliant with our supplier code of conduct, which talks about everything from environment to workers' rights to even governance. And we also have them, again, every year, make sure that they are compliant with our questionnaire. So that asks a lot of different things to, are you providing maternity leave? Are you making sure that you are compliant with your local laws? Or do you have waste reduction targets? Do you have water reduction targets to make sure that we have as much visibility with our upstream supply chain as we do within our own manufacturing plant? So just talking a little bit about our supplier policies and then back to the actual question of where are we getting our supply and all of that. The majority of our um, ingredients are sourced domestically. So that's something we really care about. We want to provide for local economies and we want to mitigate our transportation emissions. And we say, what can we get reused? What can we reuse ourselves? And what can we upcycle and divert from landfill? So I talked a little bit about in my previous little slideshow, 70% of our ingredients are upcycled food waste meaning that they would have ended up in landfill. And then we take that and we put it into our foam. So that's not providing, that's not taking from the food system itself. That's not taking usable food. It's taking food that was going to go to the landfill, which I think makes up, I think wasted food makes up about 30% of greenhouse gas emissions in the US at least, which is so much. And that's such an easy way that we can mitigate those emissions and give them a second useful life. So that's just a little bit on our sourcing. And we wouldn't be a good company if we weren't making sure that there was enough for us to scale with that supply chain and have a really robust supply chain environmentally and just strategically. So yes, there is there is enough for us to scale and not have to take from the usable food supply chain. And then just to jump in on our seaweed supply chain, so we mainly source from Europe, so France, Spain, but we also source from um, Asia as well. Um, so, for example, in Indonesia, um, but also we have seen quite a lot of studies that show positive social impacts of seaweed farming and um, com in coastal communities, especially they do generate quite a lot of jobs for uh, women in those um, areas as well. So in a way, we are very lucky to be really be part of this ecosystem and really helping growing that, um, the, what we now call the blue economy, um, not only in Asia, but also uh, in Europe as well. All right. Thanks for that. Um, Bailey, I have one for you here about um, emerging designers who um, maybe have the knowledge, but not the experience in this space working with regenerative materials. Um, what would you, what would you recommend for them uh, to, to get started to engage in this type of, of work um, really get their, their foot in the door? Mm -hmm. Well, it took me over a decade to get to the point where I was like, I really need to do something really, I want to be putting the skills I have and match that now with my values. And even still every day learning so much. Um, so I think some advice I would have is first and foremost, if you're on this call today, if you're signed up for environmental newsletters, if you are keeping tabs on 
materials through Instagram or material connection or brain of materials and um, just soaking it all up like a sponge. I know it's kind of cliche is like learn, but don't stop learning and be exposing yourself. Um, and then what I'd say next is kind of focus and say, what are you really, really good at? Are you a designer who has insane graphic design skills and you become maybe a, a storyteller, an environmental, you know, um, you help you help communicate what is otherwise a really complex system with your graphic design skills. You're an industrial designer working within a corporation um, and you are really close to manufacturing. How can you be, you know, in that seat, you are able to, you know, challenge engineers, um, suggest new material sources, uh, develop a sustainability team within your organization. Think kind of where you are, what your skills are, and then what your values are become this really amazing opportunity to focus and hone in um, and fill a gap that you see otherwise unmet um, and able to contribute there. So the only last thing I would say is, you know, throughout, um, mostly when I think about my education in industrial design, it was pretty isolated um, as a designer. In school, you often are sort of um, solo and expected to know a lot of things when you're presenting work. In school, you're wearing the designer hat, but you're also wearing an engineer hat. You're wearing a graphic designer hat. And in the real world, there's so many more, there's so much more collaboration that takes place through the process and getting really excited and comfortable with so many other disciplines. I mean, even on this call today, I talk about finances and government and um, you know material science and things that maybe aren't your discipline, but can fuel a collective mission, I'd say is the other. Um, talk, talk to people, get comfortable with collaborators and other disciplines is another part, I'd say. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so just looking at the time here, we have time for about two more questions, although we have a hundred. So sorry for um, uh, the audience, sorry to the audience for not being able to get to all of those, um, but hopefully we'll be able to answer them after this webinar, at least a few of those, but thank you for asking them. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit and then I want to come back to that that bridge between designers and brands and and regenerative materials and, and talk about partnerships for a little bit. But one um, one question that I, I we're seeing pop up a lot is um, in the chemical additive space. So I'm wondering if um, maybe Hoa or Renata, you can talk a little bit about your products or, or other regenerative materials um, in, in the space that... Um, um, and what the transparency sort of looks like when it comes to um, additives, um, toxicity, and sort of the all around safety of products uh, for, for consumers. Yeah, I can uh, have a go at some of that. So I think for us, um, we are very much aware of um, the fact that there are a lot of solutions out there that does um, have contain chemicals of concern and it's quite difficult for consumers to, to uh, distinguish between that. We do a lot of communications and education around this. We have blog posts and we work um, with a lot of organizations like Plastic Pollution Coalitions to really help provide advice uh, because we have expertise in natural materials and in packaging to really help to discern some of these um, uh, um, some of these products and and claims and also for us as well um, the 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 work around making sure that any of the material that we use that they end of life and also the fact that our processes doesn't provide any uh, chemical modifications is a very important definition that we 
use that has been introduced by the European commissions, but it's something that we have really stuck with. And we now even organize a group called Natural Polymers Group, who all kind of backing this definition as we think is the next generation of materials where we no longer have to rely on additives um, for these um, materials to, to function or, or perform. I'll just add to that a little bit. There are a lot of chemical additives out there. And I think this goes back to the greenwashing question. It can be really hard to discern, especially for a consumer, which ones are going to create microplastics, which ones have, are materials of concern for human health, and which ones just have a chemical name because that's the name of them. So I would say, again, go back to the certifications when these chemicals are tested, they can be tested for ecotoxicity, they can be tested for microplastics, they can be tested for compostability. And if they are failing in any of those, then we probably want to avoid them. And there are some ke chemical additives, like we have chemical additives in our food to make it last a little bit longer. Sometimes that can be bad. And sometimes that can be a harmless thing that just makes the shelf life slightly longer so that I can actually make it to the grocery store. So there are a lot of different chemicals out there and being a chemical is not necessarily a bad thing, although it does get a bad rap, especially in our everyday language. But there are also, we don't want to let the enemy be the perfect of the, or the perfect be the enemy of the good. So I think that there are a lot of different options out there and Hoa had a really great slide in her presentation that showed the modified versus the unmodified and natural versus unnatural that I think it was a really helpful breakdown of all of these different additives that can be a little bit better than the full 100% plastic or they can be maybe not made for the composting stream and then what kind of is the point of that. So that's just my slight add on there. I appreciate that. All right. Um, we just have a minute or so. So I just want to do a quick round, Robin, maybe a couple words or maybe just one sentence. Um, what, what's it going to take to scale these materials? What's most important to, to Cruise Foam, um, to, to Prowl Studios, to, to Nopla? Um, is it the government sector? Is it is it investments? What, what's it going to take to scale these materials? understanding, you know, partnerships are key in this space. Um, curious to hear uh, what, you, what you all think about that. We'll end it there. I think it's going to start with partnerships across the board. So we need to be working with packaging companies. We need to be working really transparently with legislators. We need to be working with consumers and we need to be working with composters to make sure that we as cruise film are making a material that is working for everyone and we're all working towards a similar goal to actually make our packaging stream and our material stream generally more circular and more regenerative. And for Nopla, uh, it's really, we would not be where we are with our supporters and our champions or in every single organization. Um, every office has a canteen. Um, most people will buy um, your food takeaway container. Um, is uh, We really rely on a lot of people asking the questions of why, uh, why we are still buying some uh, some of these products when we know that they are not good for our health. So it's uh, really, yeah, for, for everyone that's uh, listening, uh, next time you see a, a food container, um, maybe ask uh, ask the restaurants or, or ask your office to see why are we still using um, plastic lined um, boxes and that would really help to raise, um, raise some of the questions. Yeah, I think um, I'll maybe end with saying that I think that this is a very multi, um, multidisciplinary challenge and communication across so many otherwise independent industries is required from leveraging something like ag waste, which can be abundant and get that to the right people as a feedstock as just even one small example 
of communicating between two, you know, from uh, from need to usefulness, right? Um, so yeah, communication and collaboration, I think are key. All right, I have partnerships, asking questions and radical communication and collaboration. I love that. Thank you so much to everyone uh, for joining today and to our panelists. Um, so grateful to you all, hello, Renata and Bailey for joining us and providing um, such a rich and, and valuable conversation. Um, please mark your calendars for our next webinar on August 15th, the music industry's plastic free evolution. That one should be fun. And if you haven't already, we invite you to join our global coalition it's currently free to join as an individual, a business, or a nonprofit organization. Of course, you can connect with us on social media to learn more about our work. Um, we're also going to send a follow-up survey after the webinar, and we appreciate your feedback. This helps us to improve future events. We will also send a webinar, uh, sorry, a recording of this webinar um, in the coming days so that you can share it with anyone who was unable to join us today. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, thanks of course to our Plastic Pollution Coalition member groups and partners who shared this webinar and made this happen with their communities and networks. We look forward to, forward to seeing you all at our next webinar on August 15th. See you soon, thank you.